Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for choosing our, our session. Uh, just before we begin, I do want to just let you know um, that we are live streaming and also audio recording this. Uh, Jamie and I are strong believers in openly uh, sharing our learning and resources, and so um, at some point before the end of the conference, we'll get our resources from this session posted online as well. So I'm Jamie Rayburn Weir, and I'm a high school English teacher in the Waterloo Region District School Board at Huron Heights. And uh, there's my bio. <laughs> Okay, and uh, for me, Mark Carbone, um, I guess in some ways this is my old bio as I have recently uh, transitioned into a nice flexible um, schedule as a retired person. Um, so I guess retired guy is my new title, um, but um, still of course passionate about the ed tech space and how technology intersects with learning and assessment and um, hopefully you'll get a good sense of that this morning. Just an FYI, FYI too, I am not the teacher that stands at the front and lectures. I am more the teacher who's in with the students. I give them a, a little spiel at the beginning of the class. So this is not really my comfort zone, being at the front talking. So just FYI, because uh, I am very much more the, student, the teacher that works with the students. So just give you a little heads up there. Um, yeah. So uh, we want to talk a little bit about how we got to having one-to-one -one Chromebooks in our, for all our grade nines in WRDSB. But for that, we want to tell you the story of how we um, arrived at that destination. And the first thing we want to discuss is that our board is actually really, really innovative, and we have been for a very long time. Uh, and this, the WRDSB Futures Forum project started seven years ago. Mark and some other very innovative people here on our board um, did a PLP project with uh, Cheryl Nussbaum Beach and Will Richardson, and from there their brainchild was to start a class that focused on grade 10 academic level students, and they would take grade 10 academic English, and then they would take civics and careers, which we know are very much the failed courses in all of Ontario. And what they wanted to do with it was have one teacher teaching two periods a day, so you saw the same students, like for some schools they did it where it was all morning or all afternoon, or one period in the morning, one period in the afternoon, and most of them were one block of time. And so you saw the, the same teacher with the same students for all morning, for example, and they got three credits. But instead of it being that the first period was English, the second period was civics, and then halfway through the term it switched and it was careers, it was spiraled. And so um, with that, um, it was the students were in getting the all three credits, uh, but in a variety of ways. And so um, for many teachers, they used the content from civics and careers, and then the skills from English, and wove it together into uh, a kind of an assessment practice. Very project-based, very digital. A lot of stuff happened within uh, a digital community. And so from there, um, the students had a very different experience. And this started seven years ago, which is amazing. Yes. Um, and uh, they had 15 devices, right, to start with? Roughly. Yeah, so each class was given about 15 devices. Um, and truly, like, I, I said this yesterday, but um, the fact that technology moves so quickly, that seven years ago, 15 devices in a classroom was revolutionary and you could do so much of it. 15 devices now seems for us, anyway, in WRDSP, seems just like normal. And you know, they did what they could with them at that time, but we do so much more now, I think. And uh, so starting that journey, um, we really wanted to focus on that the students could work together in the collaborative space. And so there was, for example, um, I believe seven high schools started with it. And seven high schools, so they also worked together where they did projects together. So there was a group novel study. And so uh, a teacher from one school might be teaching kids from any of the other seven schools, and they worked in a digital space. Um, and some years ago, I believe they did that through Google Communities. Actually, it doesn't connect. Was it really? Originally. Yeah. Pre-Google. Pre-Google. <laughs> I also have to say, I am an uh, FFP wannabe. Uh, I never actually taught in the FFP program. I got jumped in on a couple little side projects, but I never was an FFP teacher, and I was actually really sad about that because it was such, and it's still to this day, we have it running at various schools. It was very innovative, and uh, they did some really cool things with Twitter in the early days as well, and so 
um, that was very enticing to me watching from the sidelines. So. I might just add a couple of comments to that. Um, you can see um, on this slide a couple of the focus things. We basically empowered the teachers that were in the initial group to develop their own curriculum and not worry about making it like anything else in the board. The challenge was to make it different, uh, to break down barriers. And so as Jamie described, putting these three courses together and considering the spiraled approach to achieving a two credit package uh, was very innovative and we based it on uh, these four words became kind of a slogan for us in terms of moving forward anytime anywhere anyone anything learning in other words yes the face-to-face -face time is important in the classroom but it's much more than that and um, we had the teachers design the course around um, these core elements uh, writing online um, in those days it was sort of our first efforts of moving away from paper, uh, moving into digital spaces, um, looking at students generating content, um, producing their own content, not something that was predetermined necessarily by the teacher. Um, and in terms of the social media, that was huge. We were one of the first school boards to actually weigh into the Twitter and Facebook spaces. And uh, that was such a fantastic opportunity because what we learned through that was, I mean, that's a good segue into, oops, um, what made a difference. As we started to explore the use of these other tools, um, students started feeding back to us that we liked having another way to communicate with teachers and other students. We like having a voice that's beyond the now of the classroom. And we started to discover that students that were reflective thinkers might contribute to a, a conversation or ask a question outside of the class time. And so as we encourage teachers to um, maybe not only have a website, but maybe your website was actually a public Facebook page or to have a Twitter hashtag for your class, we started to realize that this was a powerful element in student voice and how, how we look at accessing it. And I was privileged to follow along on it. A lot of these things serve as the, a remote uh, ed center person, if you would. Um, but what we started to see in here was some really interesting patterns. Uh, we started to see that students were learning from 5 a.m. until 1 in the morning. Why was that? They were learning when it fit their schedules. They weren't confining themselves to a particular class space. And you could see then they were building a community. Kids were helping kids on Twitter. Kids were helping kids on, on Facebook. It wasn't just totally uh, dependent on, on that. In terms of the teacher space, uh, Jamie uh, mentioned in the initial uh, rollout of this project, we actually had seven teachers, but one teacher in seven different schools. And what we realized after, one of the things that really made this project go, oddly enough, was the fact that these teachers were isolated. There was no easy way for them to just have a conversation with the teacher across the hall or have a conversation in the staff room they were forced to change their practice. They had to collaborate in a different way. They had to use these same tools that the kids did. And all of a sudden, that started to make a really interesting um, impact uh, on this. Um, so long and short of it is, when we started to see these trends, we started to take a look at how can we document this. And at that point in time, maybe two years into the project, the board partnered up uh, with an external uh, unbiased company to do um, some documentation. And so we ran surveys with students, teachers, parents, there was focus groups, and there was also a lot of analysis done both on uh, academic achievements and assessment, as well as students' perception of <coughs> how well they were learning, all the uh, sort of efficacy uh, part about the student learning space. And what we started to see was some interesting emerging patterns, which over time we proved transcended uh, this whole project. So in general, um, what we saw was in terms of academic space, uh, students that were taught in this manner were performing two to five percent higher. And that was a consistent result across multiple schools, multiple student cohorts, multiple years. Um, we also found that the student efficacy scores about their learning and participating in that environment were also higher. And so that for us was a big aha moment. The question was, 
how can we take those learnings and start to scale up uh, what we're doing? Um, and so, um, to continue the journey, then we talked. Well, we want to talk about that we've had a lot of other really innovative aspects of our school board. And I feel so blessed to work at WRDSB. Uh, we have had a lot of support as teachers. We have a lot of support to go and do and be creative. So I think that in some places, I feel like when you listen to other people talk, they say, we get shut down by admin. We get shut down. We have these ideas. We get, but nobody wants to support us. You know, at our, especially in my school, there's very much the culture of we'll just ask, because the worst thing that could happen is that they say no. And, but in many cases, they ask us to truly, like, what is it you really want to do? How is that going to benefit the students? And then, well, let's try and see what happens. And so um, that led to other various little projects that, and pilots that have gone on throughout. Uh, and I mentioned before, I'm an FFP groupie. And so at my high school, um, I was teaching uh, English. And the students were coming out of FFP and going into grade 11 and saying, hmm, I don't want to go to a regular English class anymore. I want to go to a class that's very similar to this. How can we continue that? And so I, my other teachable is psych, social, anthro in HSP core, so in individual society. And so um, I proposed to my principal at the time, hey, why don't we take grade 11 university English and we take HSP through you and we combine them and we do the same kind of model, but we use the content from HSP and I get at the skills of English and I spiral the curriculum. And so then, welcome to through you, you. And uh, we ran it for two years at my high school. And it was a really amazing opportunity. So I saw students, and actually the way they set it up for me was that I saw them in the morning and the afternoon. So then, um, which was great because there were lots of times in the morning, we have kids who are um, awake in the morning, but then <laughs> my afternoon class is always louder than my morning class. When you're dealing with teenagers, they actually wake up after 10 a.m. So um, we had, I would plan my classes that way actually to account for that that in the morning, if we were gonna do something a bit more on the quiet side, that was gonna be done in the morning. If I wanted some really roaring discussion, I planned that for the afternoon. My default is I'm a morning person and I like that, but you know what, it's good for the kids because they're more awake and more willing to participate that way. So it was really focused on what's best for the students. And so for us, we really, instead of focusing on you know, getting some marks, um, we spent a lot of time talking about we're learners here, and what I'm more interested in is that your skills get stronger. And so um, for a lot of students, that was a hard sell for some who hadn't to come through FFP because we opened it up to whoever wanted to go into it. The FFP kids got it right away, and they were like on board and that kind of thing. But we spent a lot of time talking about what I say to you, what I write to you in a comment is way more important than what number I put on your page or what level I put on your page. And so that was really where we, we tried to drive on the idea of it's learning that's really important to our students and for life. So we spent a lot of time with that. And the three year course was absolutely amazing. Um, I feel very honored that I got to do that. Uh, I actually moved then to a different school to take uh, the department headship at another school. And uh, so what was really fascinating that happened after that is when, because um, we were supposed to create a grade 12 version, and uh, um, because I wasn't going to be there and the other teacher that possibly could have taught it wasn't able to, um, the students then who were going into grade 12 coming out of this program uh, spent some time thinking about, oh my gosh, what do I, have, what do, I do? How am I going to go back to a regular English class and in grade 12 when it really, really counts for university? And they actually got together, they petitioned the principal, and they did a whole lot of work themselves. I had a, I spent a quite a few lunch hours trying to coach them to figure out, because you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter coming from me, it's grassroots and it's the student voice that's really important. And um, they didn't exactly get what they wanted, but they got, um, they had the, they got to listen, to, the principal listened to them and he accommodated them in the best way that he could for the school. And so the fact then that you know they then felt empowered to go and have a voice and talk to him, so amazing. So and that's but that's the spirit of our board is is the idea of voice and expressing yourself and feeling empowered. We also have the English Digital Learning Project. I participated in this uh, for two years, <clears throat> a couple years ago, 
And what the English Digital Learning Project is, is that um, is bringing together a group of English teachers across. They also have a geography digital learning project, I believe, as well. And bringing together various teachers from various schools across the board together centrally um, to plan. Um, this year, um, our assistant head is participating in it, and uh, you'll see a video from her reflecting on the experience in just a minute. But um, what we spend a lot of time doing is thinking about, is focusing on specific, expect or sorry, uh, overall expectations, but thinking about how do we really get out those strong skills and encourage students to really focus on that part of the learning. I believe this year they're focusing on the reading strand and that kind of thing, but we, as our school, we're allowed to think about, okay, where are our students weak? Whether you're looking at some data from the QAO, from a lit test, or whether you're looking at data that we just have from around our school. What we were allowed to do then was choose what we wanted to focus on and what we thought would be the best way for students to enhance their learning. And so it's very much, teachers are allowed to design a project, implement it in their classrooms, and do the research that allows us to think about what's best for kids. And so these are some reflections. This one was from, uh, that's a snippet from my blog. Um, and then that is um, from one of our consultants uh, in the board. And uh, he had also um, taken a snippet from another teacher, and this was her reflection uh, based on her experience in DLP. And so the fact that we have these programs alone, just um, where we have a lot of freedom as teachers, is really amazing. So this is uh, the, my department, or assistant department head. And uh, she's going to reflect on her experience this year with the digital learning. She's right in the middle of it. CI course wanting to give students more voice and choice. So traditionally we had used one novel as a book class novel and this year we decided we were using, going to give them choices. So I talked about the books, they provided me with a choice of the top three and they were able to, in the most, in most cases, get their first choice of their novels. So they were quite thrilled about that and they were very keen on reading and in fact the one group the bell had gone and I was kind of why are you still talking and this can we just have five more minutes to She's talk talking about the great great and college. I thought that was great so we continued and there were times when they were like I just want to finish these two pages and they had roles to complete for their novels and they would complete them online or on paper pressure them to do it online. I wanted them to do it online so that they could share it with their group members, but um, whatever they would complete, I would accept. So they did a very good job of completing their first novel, and when I gave them their second choice for their second novel, they kind of ran into some problems because it was more independent. So we brainstormed some ideas about why they were more successful with their first novel and they came up with some interesting insights and that they liked the collaboration aspect, that they liked being able to talk with a group and have clarification of problems they were facing in their reading. And so those were the two main parts. But I also noticed from my perspective that as they're working in their groups, I walk around and I this is part of the novel where you at so it builds suspense and then they're more eager to read. But that's really great for us like, to think like, that's huge success in grade 11 college because that is typically one of the hardest courses um, to motivate students in for us, especially in English. And we talk a lot, we're talking a lot from an English perspective because that's my wheelhouse, but there are lots of other programs that are happening across the board uh, in other disciplines. and. Um, like the big message here for us is that it's you know, we we feel empowered as teachers to go ahead and say I have this idea uh, what do you think and that's the message that's come from top down that you know what we are an innovative culture and that we live in KW and uh, we are an innovative uh, spot in the province and so we need to model that as well in our school system. And so um, that really comes through for us as teachers because we are empowered to try new things. 
So at this point in the presentation, you can see there's been a heavy emphasis on figuring out the learning part of the classroom. What makes a difference? What's not only important for uh, teachers and administrators, but maybe most importantly, what matters to kids around having access to technology, having access to a variety of digital tools. And it was really at this point, I think, we thought we had enough research, enough evidence, um, and I want to do a shout out to uh, Michael Morgan, who's here today in the IT department at the school board, because what you haven't heard in any of this conversation yet is all of the things that happened behind the scenes to uh, prepare this kind of environment. So while all of these projects were going on and we were doing this important on the, on the ground work with teachers, uh, we spent time building capacity um, on our Wi-Fi network. And so there was an uh, enormous amount of um, time in studying the network design. Um, of course, we live in a time where um, security, data integrity, student privacy, all of those things matter. But another question that also matters is, how do we set up our network and allow students to access tools such as Facebook, Twitter, and other digital spaces while you're protecting corporate assets? And, and how do you make that happen in a, a really good way? Um, we started to look at uh, Wi-Fi density, and we talked to principals and teachers about where will be the heaviest use in your school, and those became the places where we started the program. It wasn't decided by IT that we'll just start in room A100 and work our way through the school. We actually talked to the schools about the heaviest use, how will your timetabling go for next year, how can we match our Wi-Fi deployment program to fit in with the student instructional needs in your school. We did a lot of work studying schools around dead spots. We don't want them. And at this point in time, if we fast forward, forward, a wonderful network's in place. We decided that uh, we didn't want to bother with um, syncing devices and all this kind of business. And so we put a plan in place, I guess, Michael, three years ago, um, that we wanted to have a 10 gigabit network right from the access point in the school right up to the internet. And that's what's in place today, is solid 10 gigs. And so we're at a point in the school board where there's um, about a mobile device for two thirds of the kids in the board. And we know for a fact that they can all be online at the same time functioning <coughs> with issues, kids using Google Hangouts, kids using uh, YouTube streaming, kids using virtual learning environments. Um, a variety of tools, and in our view, from an IT planning perspective, Wi-Fi has to be like hydro. It's <coughs> there, it works, and it has to be easy. Not here's the 50 steps to get onto our network. You can't access this, you can't access that. It was all about the ease. And so that, with that philosophy, it was really interesting to move from Jamie's part of the story into our first um, pilot project where it was sort of a live proof of concept for moving into one-to-one. -one. So on this model, uh, we chose three schools. One was Jamie's school um, and two others. And we wanted to work through the logistics. What does the planning look like? Again, we did not want this to be IT's telling the schools how to do this. The given is we're rolling out the service. The thing that we've learned is the importance, even at the rollout stage, of differentiation. When we actually got to the conversations, we recognized that schools wanted to do their rollouts differently, and we could accommodate them. And I'm going to play a video for, uh, for you in a second with uh, Colette Lush that digs into some of that. Uh, we started to talk about communications, what would be required. And so we worked collaboratively using our Google environment to develop uh, sort of a a code of conduct, and of course everybody wants to get into the weeds. Well, what happens when a kid drops their Chromebook? Well, yeah, that is a good question. Uh, but more importantly, the, the counter question is, how does that fit into other board business? And so there was really interesting conversation there, just pushing back on even the idea of asking that question, like what do you do when a kid sits on their flute or cracks their football helmet? It's just a school resource. It's no different. And we finally landed on this piece that a student would be issued their Chromebook in grade nine. The intent was they would keep it for four years. They would take it home every night. Um, they would charge it and bring it back. They would keep it over the summer. 
And that's their digital tool. And it's a digital tool to access any resources that teachers feel is necessary. And so that built a really interesting model in terms of how the rest of the parent communications flowed. Because it wasn't just, this is a, an X dollar device and what happens when it drops. The message was, this is an important tool. It's so important, we're issuing one to every student. And this is what we expect. We expected that kids would take them home, they recycled the box at home, that they would charge them, that it's their personal device. There's no file syncing, we built the network so you just jump on and use it and everything's in Google Drive. Uh, we didn't worry about any of that, it's ease of use. And um, by doing that, it meant it was also easy for kids to take their Chromebook and go to a library or a friend's house or <coughs> Starbucks. Um, wherever, no, you, wherever you do. No. Is that a rule? Well, I never followed that. Um, Unless we're all spare. Yeah, that was it. Uh, the other thing that schools wanted, uh, and I, I, I need to say this out loud because this was really important. In terms of preparing the staff for this, it's, there's no replacement for building grassroots in interest. You have to do that. And we asked teachers going into this a very small number of what we thought of as core competencies. So going into this, we asked them that over the summer, we want you to learn the Google environment, know how to use Google Classroom, know how to set permissions on Google Documents, understanding the implications of sharing and so on. On the IT side, we developed a nice, uh, robust and pretty open approach to using Google Apps. And um, it, our environment's not all that locked down. Most of the features are on, they're available. And people like that because when they try things, you can just go ahead and, and they work. And so I do want to share this little video with Colette because it'll give you a sense of uh, the rollout that happened at Huron Heights uh, Secondary School. Whoops.
Yeah, we pretty much invented our own inventory system. Everything is based on barcodes. And we're actually using Google Forms as a database, if you want to call it that, um, where we're inputting all information and we're drawing different um, results uh, in terms of student applications, student uh, damage reports, uh, with our inventory. So it is a fairly thorough setup that we have here. And by having that in place for our second rollout, having those barcodes to be able to scan to enter all the inventory sped up the process significantly. Um, for us at our school, I think we had around 325 notebooks that we rolled out. It took us two and a half days. I'm sure um, just with the normal uh, wear and tear once in a while you've got uh, a situation to deal with where students maybe damaged a Chromebook or something. So how do you handle that? For physically damaged Chromebooks, um, I can assess them. I can let the VP know what's going on and then they deal with the student, they deal with the actions. If we have a Chromebook that has a, a, a warranty issue, all the in-school techs are Dell certified, which means that we can do warranty work on the Dell Chromebooks. We have swap stock in place here so we can take their Chromebook and issue a new Chromebook to them before the end of the day. If it's something that we can fix on site, we can do that. Or we can log a claim with Dell because again, we're certified through Dell that we now have access to their um, online tools for TechDirect. It's such a slick process that Dell has <laughs> set up as well. That we send in the Chromebook uh, in a box that they provide, they fix it, they send it back, and the turnaround time is just it's, it's great. They have very good uh, customer service. The Chromebook is it's a very good product. We've had other Chromebooks um, used at the school here, a different manufacturer, and they definitely were not as durable as the Dells are. Um, in pay terms of um, failure rates, let's say over 600 Chromebooks that we rolled out over the first two years, I had two out of the box that weren't functioning properly. So, yeah, yeah, it was insignificant, really. So I hope that that clip gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, what happens in, in some of the background. I think more importantly for uh, me and my time at the board, and I know the ongoing work that Michael and the team are doing, is that this is just one model. Again, we respected the fact that not every school wanted to do their rollout exactly like this. And so um, I know one of the schools, just as one, one other example, rather than delivering to home rooms, they actually had the students come down to um, a space in, in either a library gym, a larger space, and they actually met their vice principal that way. Welcome to the school, here's your Chromebook, the vice principal shakes the kid's hand, and right then there's that 90 second conversation about you know, what's expected, the importance of this digital tool, and so right then there's a personal connection uh, that's made in a positive way. A child's not going to the office because there's some issue to be detangled, they're getting a wonderful device that's going to move their education forward. And so, again, it's, it's great and it's, uh, you know, applauding people for recognizing and valuing the idea of differentiating the approaches that not everything has to be just a cookie cutter. So, from, uh, so um, in terms of the classroom, um, what's really interesting is that, so this semester I have two sections of grade 10s. So all the grade 10s in our school and all the grade 9s, so half of our school have Chromebooks. And if you walk around the room and you see when they're logging into Google Classroom, there's probably, each kid has at least probably six different classrooms up there. Uh, many of them, almost all teachers on, on our staff are using Google Classroom, but also sports teams, um, and uh, um, when we did the prep for the OSSLT, they set up a classroom for that, and students had access to all the resources for prepping for that. And so what we've really done is we've given the students access to um, learning at any time. And not that they didn't have that before, but now they have from us. And so um, we actually interviewed a couple students uh, last week. One of the things they were talking about was that um, their teachers have really jumped on the idea of doing things like um, screencasting. And so they were saying in math, for example, one of their teachers um, screencasts all his lessons. And he does it on, like in class. So every day when he's doing a lesson for the group, 
he's screencasting for them. And so then he posts that in Google Classroom. So every day, students have that video that they can access at any time. And uh, one of the students was talking about that, you know, math is something that she struggles with. And what she's able to do then is to rewatch that video at home. She's able to rewatch that video with a peer or a family member or whatever and help her understand and deconstruct what's going on there. So just having that capability to have, which is very similar to a flipped classroom model, but it's her own teacher there, not from a Khan Academy or whatever. Um, so she's able then to do that. Or um, they were also talking about that we use Hangouts a lot, so Google Hangouts, and so uh, often students will get messages, will message a teacher or send us an email through Gmail, and they get pretty instantaneous feedback from us. So that's been really interesting, and for us, it's thinking about, it's about the descriptive feedback piece, um, that we can get that uh, in real time learning for them, and so that's been a really amazing opportunity for the students. In interest of time, I'm going to give you a one minute cap on the rest of the slides. We'll share the slide deck, and, as well as the video from today. Um, but I want to make sure we have some time for some interactive dialogue and questions here. So, um, one of the one of the best things um, for us, I think, in this whole thing is looking at uh, professional development and recognizing that teachers need to own their own learning. They don't need to be told what to do. So I mentioned earlier about having these sort of minimum core set of um, comfort with Google and the apps that were going to be used, um, but beyond that there was an expectation that teachers would set their own agenda, that we would try to set cultures in the schools where people could own the journey. Let them learn the things that they need to learn rather than selling them on some prepackaged, you should do this next. Well, the next for every teacher is different. And so uh, we tried to honor that as part of the process. There's lots of video resources in here, and this is the piece that Jamie just kind of finished with. We've talked about the technology environment, how that impacts learning. We've talked about the student perspective. I think the ground that's in the middle and using technology as a catalyst to disrupt and, and help people change their practice, not just think of a one-to-one -one rollout as just a technology thing. I hope the message that you get from today is it's way more than that. Yes, that's critical, but in the end, it's about empowering people to learn. It's about empowering teachers to change the practice and teach in a new, robust way um, that's part of their journey. And so there's videos in here from superintendents. Um, we've looked at the use of, of spaces. We've got an unbelievable amount of news coverage uh, from getting that in, so there's lots of links to uh, various newsletters here. Um, and we tried to interview a diverse teachers. Like here's a great interview with a music teacher about how kids are using Chromebooks in their music class. Yes, there's traditional band and choir classes, but you should watch that video and see what this teacher is doing to change her practice and empower students to learn <coughs> other things in the arts curriculum outside of sort of the traditional band, choir kind of performance venues. Um, and that actually was uh, featured in the Global Mail. Uh, so with all that Reader's Digest version of the slides, let's entertain some questions and dialogue. Yes, sir. So apart from the wonderful stuff that's going on pedagogy-wise, get that, that's what I do. I'm more curious on some more pragmatic pieces with the hardware. Do some students say that, oh, with the Chromebook, I might as well just bring my Mac? There is there. And they're, and they're okay with that? Yeah. And yeah. how did you deal with powering up machines in classrooms from a, like is there the electricity in the rooms? Um, Extension cores, well, power bars, Well, the, we, the students are supposed to charge their Chromebooks at home. How's that go? Um, if actually, to be honest with you, most of them do. So, uh, like I teach grade 10 academic and grade 10 applied, and, you know, every now and then a kid will be like, can I plug into the wall? Sure, whatever. Now they just do it if they need to charge their Chromebook. But, and I have an extra cord that um, I loan out you know, for with collateral, but at the same time, it's very, like, in my class of 22 Ps, I maybe have two kids who don't charge their Chromebook on a regular basis. So they really, like, because they like to use it, it's important to them, so they charge it, and they bring it to school. I would say additionally, too, um, as part of the parent communication, we rolled that expectation out up front. 
and the model of Chromebook that we selected has about a seven hour battery life, so we'll easily get through a semester school day with half a battery left. Um, so, you know, most of the, the uh, school libraries will have, you know, a spare power bar and also a couple loaner charges if kids need them, but essentially in chatting with staff in all the schools, it's been absolutely a non-issue. <coughs> So just to jump on that, we're in year two of our one-to-one, -one and we haven't added any additional like infrastructure for power or anything like that. We've done the same thing with the Chromebooks this the last of the day. It's amazing. I just want to throw in something so everybody understands. The power consumption overall in the school board continues to go south because of these emissions. So I'm part of the, we did the math, Mark and I, just around the map of power consumption. And even with the increase in boxes, the power consumption is going south. They're charged at home. Yeah. So one thing we didn't mention today, too, is as we roll out the Chromebooks and we've got this sort of four-year phased approach to it, what's trailing behind is a gradual withdrawal of school labs, which will further enhance power savings because at the end of the day, if you've got a school with, say, 1,200 secondary school students, you don't need eight labs. You might need two or three for specialty things, uh, but you certainly don't need eight. So the overall power consumption piece only improves over time. I think you had a question there. Yeah. Is the constant access Facebook, Twitter affecting teacher stress? Because, um, that's, a, that's a good question, but we use it as a teaching opportunity because those are not going away. Those students, you know, like I think it's not just students, it's adults too, mm -hmm. right, who are like addicted to whatever. And so we use it as an opportunity to just say to the students, you know what, this is a time where you close your Chromebook, you turn your phone over or whatever, and you just interact face to face with people. And so we use this not, we don't see that as a distraction, you know, we really use this as a teaching opportunity to how to manage that. Because social media and all the things that students are doing with their devices, we talk about, well, are you getting your work done? Are you being an effective contributor to the class? And if you're not, then you need to think about what you're doing with your time, because that, at the end of the day, is important. It's one of the skills they're going to need to manage in life. And that is, you know, lots of people struggle with the idea of, oh my gosh, they have, a, they have access to Twitter, Facebook, whatever, all the time. <laughs> but it's a teaching piece, because how do you manage that? I mean, like, I love my phone, but there's lots of times where I have to, like, call it, like consciously make the choice to not go on it, and I think, that is us modeling and teaching them as well, how you manage that um, for yourself. An interesting benefit for me personally too is, of course, my own daughter went through our, our school system. And when she would come home and say, Dad, we did this today. And you know what made it easy? We went on Facebook, we made a group, the kids joined the group, we just did our work and guess what? Two of the kids were at school and one, one was in another school. You know, one was at home and we just collaborated. So there's lots of tools there. So I think we got three questions, four or five. So um, can you talk a little bit about uh, bandwidth connectivity and prioritizing uh, Google Docs over social media? <laughs> so is your network prioritized in terms of kids accessing? No, uh, we don't run any kind of uh, filter. Well, there's some content filtering in place, but there's nothing that says we'll prioritize Google them. gets more priority than some other website. Um, when I left, um, I think that was a screenshot I took on the last day as kind of a memory of our, where things were. And um, that was our intent, was to build a network where you just get on and use it and you're not worried about competing things. So that was our approach to it. Being enough pipe, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yes. What about your financial model? I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you extrapolate this to at some point in time extend that to the entire board, right? And, and how do you see that funding? So interestingly enough, um, Michael, how many hours did we spend uh, crunching numbers? Well, we wrote a program. <laughs> yeah. Um, but essentially, uh, the beauty of this model is the number of extra dollars required to do this was zero. And it was zero because of the price point. Um, it was zero because as you lead with Chromebooks, you're withdrawing labs at, at the end. Um, so in our case, when we get 
if I could throw the ball out two more years ahead, at that point where um, every child has a Chromebook in secondary schools and the labs are being withdrawn, it's all within existing IT dollars. So we didn't do any of this by asking the board for more money. So from my perspective, and, and I think people <coughs> concur, unless there's some kind of massive change in how government funding works, or um, they do a massive restructure of, um, I'll say, the fairly traditional use of budget patterns over the last 10 years in the school board, um, we're golden. This will just roll on. There's no way that it can't work. Um, so, um, we're good there. Chris? So we, we got a one-to-one -one that started in the elementary and the secondary we're just starting. Uh, I've got actually a pedagogical question. Is it, was there a conflict as you tried to scale in secondary between this new way of teaching and learning and the traditional standardized testing with EQAO and, um, and uh, um, um, the standardized literacy test because they are legacy formats and trying to move teachers away into the new standard of learning but preparing the students for those testing can produce a friction. I'm just wondering how you handled that. So at Huron, what we do is um, we're a five period a day school, so we have what's called MSIC, multi-subject instructional period, and so which essentially is a study hall period. And so we've done all of our lit test prep through that. Okay. And so the students, so it's, we do it in English as well, just because we feel responsible. And to, be, to give a, a lot of credit to the rest of our staff, it's also built into certain other classes. So like in, um, we spend a lot of time thinking about the questions they ask on the lit test, and so we use that language. Say in the Z, if they're asking a question, they may use the language from the lit test on there. If we have, if we have, um, um, like in geography, they do the news report. So we build it in, but our lit test prep is typically run through our MSIP periods. 